Thank you very much. And you're getting certainly a diverse uh, series of talks today. So we're, we're going to look at a, a bit of the universe inside our own bodies, uh, the sort of opposite of what we've been seeing before. And I want to just, before we get into that, just tell you a bit about how I got into this uh, myself. Um, basically, it was about th at about 3,000 meters, I was doing something called ski touring in Italy, which is a, a a strange, uh, rather silly sport where you walk up for six hours and you ski down for an hour, and it, it's very tiring. And at the last day, and I was really not feeling well, and I started falling all over the place, and I thought, oh, well, this is um, just the end of a long week. Got to the bottom, and I had double vision. And uh, this uh, persisted, and being a, a medical doctor, I realized this wasn't good news, that uh, it was either you know, MS, brain tumor, or some form of stroke. None of them were particularly great. And so um, after a very stressful few months of scans and things, it turned out I had a very small uh, occlusion, a sort of micro stroke, if you like, of one of the uh, vessels supplying the eye uh, nerves. Now, my blood pressure went up, and suddenly I went from being healthy to being, um, like most people, uh, slightly unhealthy with some disease, taking tablets, and uh, wanting to help improve my health. And I thought, I'm a doctor, I've been studying obesity, genetics for 20 years, should be fairly straightforward to work out the best way to lose weight and exactly what to eat. And I was completely mistaken. <laughs> Nothing could be harder, and when you went to the internet, you were faced with uh, masses of quackery and um, obsessional religious groups stating that their, their way was the only true path to salvation. And also even the government's own advice, uh, the Public Health England advice about nutrition, um, yes, it contains some facts which were accepted by everybody, eat more plants and vegetables, eat a bit less of it, uh, eat less processed foods and less sugar, but uh, at least half of it was extremely contentious and without any evidence base, such as uh, eat less salt, um, uh, have more starchy foods, uh, eat regularly small amounts and often rather than in, in short periods, um, eat, um, food, have food supplements and use artificial sweeteners rather than sugar, and above all, count calories. And all of this is without any real evidence base some of it has actually been disproven by other randomized trials. So, um, and the whole idea, really, of the last uh, 40 years of nutrition and uh, telling people to count calories uh, has been totally flawed. Even the most hardened, uh, obsessional nutritionist cannot possibly count their own calories. Even if they read all the labels and you only shop from a place that's counted it, even those have huge errors in them. So if, everyone's been, if we've been counting calories and are... Obesity rates have been going up threefold over the last 40 years. Something's very wrong. So this was all telling me uh, at the same time as I was um, working on another field from the twins that there might be something else going on. And that's something else that to explain all these discrepancies. And what this was was for me the understanding that there's a new organ in our bodies, a newly discovered organ that uh, we call the microbiome which is the community of microbes that live in our bodies, on our bodies, we're surrounded by it everywhere in this room, but in ourselves, 99% of them live in our lower intestines. And this community, which includes bacteria, fungi, viruses, and other uh, organisms called archaea and protists, all live together, uh, just like they do in your yogurt, in nice happy groups, and the best way to think of them is as a, a new organ. And together, they have as many cells, uh, they have, there are many more organisms as there are cells in our own body, and they have maybe a 1,000 times more genes. And each of those genes is capable of being a chemical factory that can pump out all kinds of chemicals, proteins, hormones that our body lacks. And so we can't live without them, and we've rediscovered really recently how important they are to all facets of our life, and particularly 
how it interacts with our diet. Now, no two people are the same. All of you would share 99.5% of your genes with each other, your DNA. And in fact, uh, you can turn around to everybody in this room and say, isn't it great? We're all fifth cousins. <laughs> Some of you might be third or fourth cousins, really close. And so we realize that actually, you know, as, as a group of people, we're very similar. But if I asked you to compare your microbiomes, you wouldn't be anywhere near fifth cousins. You'd probably be like 10th or 12th cousins because you'd only share about 25% of your microbes with each other, and all of you are going to have very individual microbes, unique microbes only to you. And so for some reason, they like only you. They don't like your neighbor. And you should be privileged that they've decided to, 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 to take <laughs> hold in your bodies, not someone else's. Because generally, uh, these things are good. And this individuality explains why there isn't really one diet fits all. It explains why when you put identical twins on uh, diets, um, as they've done here, some, uh, you get as well as differences between the twins, you also see differences in the population of uh, fourfold differences in how people will gain or lose weight on exactly the same food. And we've all seen that. We've all seen some people that seem to do very differently. Uh, and they say, well, I, need, I eat lettuce. And another one says, oh, I, I eat masses of cake every day. And we've always said, oh, that must be genetic um, or metabolism or something weak. But it turns out it, genes don't explain much of it. And most of that can be explained by the differences in our microbes. Now, these microbes do all kinds of things. I'm not going to explain all this, but just to, it's, just to open the scope of what these, these guys can do. They can alter whether you're likely to get an allergy, and we're in an epidemic, if you haven't noticed, of food allergy at the moment in young people, whereas uh, I didn't know anyone when I went to school who had food allergy. Now everyone's got it. Um, and these microbes are the keys to allergy, about how um, our immune system recognizes threats and, and gets it wrong or right. Um, we... Also, they, they, they can change chemicals in the brain, making you hungrier or thirstier or choose certain foods. Certainly in insects, they can do that, decide what you want to eat. Um, they can also alter your mood. They produce metabolites like serotonin, which um, are responsible for anxiety and depression, and many drugs are based on that. Then they can do all kinds of things about controlling how your uh, whether you, your gut is leaking or not, or all kinds of other systems of how you digest foods. So it's huge. And we're just at the tip of the iceberg, really, about discovering uh, all the things that these guys do. Now, to summarize masses of science into one picture um, is tricky, but uh, i have um, at a stage in life where I can do this without people telling me off. Um, <laughs> Because people say, well, what is this microbiome stuff? I've heard of it, but it, it, every study varies a bit. And you know, is there really one microbe that um, is responsible for one disease? And the reality is, no, the studies do differ. They've been relatively small. But there are some consistencies. What we find in every single study where we combine, compare people, a group of people with a disease, um, say it's diabetes or it could be colitis or food allergy or Parkinson's or depression, whatever it is, uh, with another group that's super healthy, we'll always find that the group with the disease have a less diverse microbiome community. They have less species. If you count them up, there just aren't those number of uh, plants, if you like. And so that's why I've used the analogy here of the garden. The English country garden uh, is what you would like to have. Okay, so you guys are all super healthy. You've got English country garden type microbes, lots of different species, all interacting with each other in a fertile soil that contains both fungi, it's got microbes, and everything's feeding off each other. For any keen gardeners will know what I'm talking about, that all those nutrients are used, it's all being recycled, and it's very hard for invaders to come in and take over. Whereas the sick people, their, their guts look like an Arizona backyard, okay? Bit of toxic waste, 
um, a few uh, nasty bugs there taking over, it's very easy to transform that. And you can just visualize how um, the number of products, helpful products produced in an Arizona backyard are much less than in your English country garden. They're producing all kinds of aromas and chemicals and things for all the insects and, and the roots and everything is, is far more productive. So the more you've got of these guys, the better it is. That's the, that's the main key here. Um, now, we did something called a citizen science project uh, for the last few years with uh, our American cousins. And this was people uh, who were interested in their gut microbes were donating, they're paying for their own research, really. And you can still do this if you join the British Gut Project. Uh, you pay a small donation, uh, and then you give a small donation of your poo. <laughs> it's poo. We call it poo in the post. And you send it back to us, and uh, we sequence it genetically. In the same way we would look at your genes, we look at the microbes, and that's how we discover what all these species are. Then we put it all together, big computers, and start looking at these patterns. And this is of 11,000 people, and we can clearly show some patterns. We can clearly show differences between Americans and Brits, just based on their microbes. And we can tell differences between Northerners and Southerners, and of people living in the country and people in, in towns. Now, we can't go into the individual differences in terms of microbes, but we can see those patterns. And the good news is we're not quite as unhealthy as the Americans, but, we started, uh, but I think we do pretty badly on the world scale. And the one thing that determined this summary health, gut health, if you like, which I'm calling diversity, where you want maximum diversity, the number one thing we found um, was not whether you were vegan, not whether you were vegetarian, not whether you're gluten-free or lactose-free or any one of these other religions, but actually, the, just the number of different plants you ate every week. Okay? And I'm talking not just, you don't have to have, uh, and that doesn't mean having 20 portions of kale every day. It means having uh, different seeds, different herbs, uh, different spices, um, and it's mixtures of fruits and berries and nuts and all these kind of things together because each of those are fuel for your microbes. And that was more important than whether you self-said, I'm a vegetarian, I'm a vegan, I'm healthy, I'm, I'm a paleo person, I'm whatever. Okay, So that's the key. So you can do all those other things, call yourself what you want, as long as you've got lots of variety on your plate. You don't get caught in a rut. Um, now, the government tells us to cut down on sugar. Um, and uh, they also tell us to cut down on antibiotics, and we know that antibiotics are really bad for your guts. Um, and today, they're given out like Smarties. But we know that children given antibiotics do get fatter and do have more allergies. It's very hard to avoid it because a lot of antibiotics are in our food, uh, in our meat particularly, if it's cheap, or processed meat. Um, emulsifiers come in all kinds of sources, and we know that emulsifiers in processed foods do also influence your microbes make them stick together a bit, stop them working. Preservatives, uh, we, we know less about, but we're worried about them. But we do know that artificial sweeteners, I don't know how many people here take an artificial sweetener on the basis that it's supposed to be healthy. Anyone admit to taking any? One of you. Well, there must be more than that, but OK. Um, OK, so generally, they're supposed to be inert, right? Not supposed to do anything. Um, I went into a metabolic chamber and, and took some sucralose, which is the commonest one in the UK at the moment, and that's my, uh, you can see my glucose uh, went up. I was wearing a 24-hour glucose monitor, and so just having sucralose, it peaked. And this was uh, telling me that these things are far from inert, and there are a number of studies now showing they reduce diversity and increase metabolic signals. So our whole idea of what foods are safe and non-safe needs a new thought when we start to think about our gut microbiome as a novel organ in our bodies. Um, as part of my book, The Diet Myth, I did lots of um, studies, and I'd just come off a, a rigorous uh, three-day uh, raw, uh, so raw milk French cheese diet. Um, <laughs> obviously, you've obviously tried it yourselves. <laughs> um, 
helped down only with the help of a little bit of red wine. Um, and it's, it was fantastic just eating a poisse, um, uh, roquefort, and brie de mo, which are three unpasteurized cheese you can easily get in the UK, uh, because they have extra microbes. And I was trying to see if I could build up my uh, microbes in just three days. Um, I didn't, as it matter of fact, but I did enjoy very much the day one of the, the diet. Day two, not so good. By day three, I'd really had enough cheese for the week, I could tell you. Um, and the next study I was going to do um, was to do the 10 days McDonald's challenge. <laughs> Bit of a contrast there. Only all my meals at McDonald's, and uh, I wasn't very looking forward to it because I wasn't a big, not a big fan, but I do anything for science, of course. Um, and it it turned out that there was someone better qualified than me, someone who actually liked uh, eating burgers and, and fast food. Uh, he was a student. He was hard up for money. He was also my son. <laughs> so he ticked all those boxes. Fantastic. So Tom did this, and uh, all his friends used to follow him into the, uh, uh, the McDonald's and take pictures of him because he was getting all this free food. And everyone, the staff uh, knew him for those 10 days. Um, but um, he, um, he, he came back to me um, after uh, uh, just uh, four days and said, I'm really not feeling very well. Um, my friends say I'm going a bit gray. Um, and uh, I think we, we ought to stop now. And as a, as a concerned parent, obviously, I was worried about his health, but said, no way, we're going to carry on. <laughs> we're going to publish this in the Sunday Times, which is exactly what we did. Um, and when, when we published in the, uh, after 10 days, he really was feeling even worse, and uh, we even noticed, even in him, a, a drop in his academic achievements, which was something. Um, but what was worse is he'd lost 40% of his gut microbes. So his diversity had plummeted in those 10 days, um, and really, we had to ask the reason why that was, because the traditional view of junk food if you like, oh, it's just lots of fat and lots of sugar. It's a very sort of naive idea, and maybe chemicals. Uh, that's why you shouldn't have it. But from a, a gut microbe point of view, what happens when you have that kind of diet? You're not getting any fiber at all. They need fiber to live, okay? The only fiber is a little green gherkin that the most kids throw away anyway. <laughs> so he had 10 days with virtually no fiber and lots of fat and lots of sugar, and I think it's that imbalance that really uh, messed up the gut microbes, messed up his gut health. And that's why we just need to think differently about this. But that's where it, it's the lack of something rather than necessarily this idea that these things are all toxic. We need to be thinking of because microbes are good. The more you've got, the healthier you are, the better you are. If we destroy them other ways, then we're in real trouble. Now, um, he, he stayed bad actually for several years. Uh, as he kept reminding me when he wanted more money. <laughs> uh, but I think we've, we may have finally sorted them out now. Um, now, uh, that's just an end of one study, obviously, and an anecdote. Um, in, our, in our twins that we follow, um, half identical, half non-identical, we followed a group between 30 and 80, 3,000 of them, uh, that we had very close measurements over, because we've. this is the most detailed uh, study of twins in the world that we run, and we have uh, every few years they come in for a test and a, and a body composition scan, and we saw that over that time, as usual in middle age, most people gain weight. Very unusual not to, and those that had high fiber lost less weight, uh, and particularly weight around the gut, the internal visceral fat, than those that are on low fiber diets. And each extra gram of fiber uh, people ate uh, reduced their weight gain by two kilograms. So even a tiny amount of change in fiber seems to have a very big effect. And this was related to their microbial diversity. So we could directly link what they were doing with how it was changing the microbes. So we seem to now have a, a better understanding of why fiber is good for you. It's not the old days of, oh, it's just roughage. It just passes straight through you and gets rid of toxins, which uh, I was taught you know, a very physical presence of it um, as a, like a, a substance that just, you know, cleared scouring uh, the inside of it and cleared everything out. Now there's a real metabolic understanding that this stuff is there fueling your microbes. Um, 
We also looked at the genetics of this because in our twin study, virtually everything we look at turns out to be genetic, except whether you like Mr. Bean or what football team you support. Um, and uh, this turned out to be a bit of an exception. It's not very genetic at all. It's about 10% uh, or so heritable. Some microbes are genetic, but the vast majority seem to just go with the environment you live in and in your diet. And that was important for us uh, because it suddenly realized the potential to change your microbiome is much greater than to change your genes. Now, the other thing we looked at was pairs of identical twins, remember these are genetic clones, where one was much bigger than the other one. And you can't explain that in terms of their upbringing because they lived together till the age of 18, generally, and uh, you can't explain it uh, in terms of their gene genes because they're identical in every cell in their body. So this particular pair differed by about 15 to 20 kilograms over most of their adult life. And when we added up these pairs, we found that in nearly all cases, the skinny one had more diverse microbes and had particular microbes that liked them and not their sister. And there are a couple of these that are called Christensenella and Acomancia that we only found in the skinny twin. And when we looked, we, about 10% of people have these Christensen, this Christensenella microbe, uh, and the people that have it in high numbers always tend to be on the skinny side. And some people reported they could eat whatever they liked, uh, s snacking on things. They never got fat. Aren't they lucky? Um, and when we took these microbes from the twins and put them into mice, we could stop them getting fatter. Now, that shows you that it isn't just an association due to being skinny or being fat, but actually it's, it's part of the causal pathway. And this is the clever thing about gut microbes is you can do the experiments in humans, but you won't know whether it's cause or effect, and then you can take those microbes, transplant them into these animals and make them fat, make them thin, make them depressed, make them anxious, uh, do all kinds of stuff to them, change their immune systems. And this is why we know that they're so important and not just bystanders in what's going on. So this is really important. And there are companies now trying to experiment with these microbes, putting them into breakfast cereals and things so uh, everyone can eat as much as they like and stay thin. They haven't succeeded yet, though. Um, that's how to do badly. Um, how can you improve your, your microbes, I guess, is the other question. And um, I don't know if any of you listened to the, f the food program on Radio 4. Um, so I went with Dan Saladino to Tanzania and an anthropologist um, uh, called Jeff Leach, who's been studying the Hadza, who are a tribe that have been in this part of uh, Tanzania for about 10,000 years, uh, possibly 50,000 years, in exactly the same way of life. So they're one of the last hunter-gatherers uh, on the planet. And they have 30 or 40% more microbes than we have, even the healthier of the stuff. And it, they don't get chronic diseases, they don't get fat, they don't get diabetes, they don't get heart disease, they don't get cancer. They do fall out of trees and have other injuries and uh, infections, etc. but they don't have any of the sort of allergies or disease we have. So we think it's their way of life, we think it's their microbes. And I went there for uh, four days to live with them, eat their meat and basically at what they did. No washing facilities, obviously, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and um, as well as a fascinating time, I did manage to improve my microbes by about 20% or so in terms of diversity. Uh, but this was only a short-lived effect. As soon as I got back on the aeroplane home and started eating aeroplane food, I think everything dropped back to where it was. So I need to stay there a bit longer or keep going back there for a top-up. But it does show that by changing diets and environment, you can actually improve to some extent uh, your microbiome. Um, a bit about what the foods are good and bad for your gut microbes. Everyone knows, knows green vegetables are good, uh, high in fiber, and there are certain fibers that are better than others. And the fibers, well, at least we've studied them more. And so the ones we've studied is something called inulin, which is in, uh, particularly in, uh, vegetables such as artichokes, um, uh, both globe artichokes and Jerusalem artichokes, also known as fartichokes, uh, that 
we'll have masses of inulin which the microbes break down and convert into very helpful things called short-chain fatty acids. So they, they're converting this as a, like, as I said, they're chemical factories, converting the chemicals in the plants you eat into other useful substances. So knowing which ones these are, onions, garlic, um, leeks, all have very high amounts of these um, in it. And also, we know the legumes are useful. And then we have um, things that also have lesser amounts of fiber, but have other things that are important. So in the past, we've been told that drinking coffee is bad for you, peanuts are bad for you, red wine's bad for you, uh, olive oil's bad for you. But it turns out that all these things uh, and dark chocolate uh, bad for you. It turns out the recent evidence is that it's all good for you. So, okay. But the reason it's all good for you is not just we got it all wrong before, it's because they all have some a chemical component in them that the microbes use, and that's called polyphenols. Okay, so polyphenols have been around. They used to be called antioxidants, which was just a general way of um, scientists and doctors pretending they knew what they were talking about. <laughs> because no one really understands uh, why we, these things were, were helpful. It was just a general word for things that mop up nasty things. But this is a much better theory because these polyphenols, we can't actually use ourselves, but for the microbes, it's rocket fuel. They love polyphenols. They break down. They get these polyphenols. They use them as energy sources, and they then convert that into other helpful chemicals for our, uh, the lining of our gut and our immune system. So it's a sort of a good deal, basically, we get. And that's why uh, the Mediterranean diet is particularly good for you, because of uh, all these polyphenols, despite the saturated fat that traditionally we're told to avoid. And, that's, then, the other, and then we've got a few other things in here. So you've got, you can see some yogurt there. Uh, how many people here have yogurt every day? Wow, look at you. You're like a commercial. <laughs> how many people here have kefir? OK. Who hasn't heard of kefir? Okay, uh, kefir is the, is the new super yogurt. Okay, you you will have heard now you've heard about it, but you'll you'll start seeing it now. Um, when I wrote, it's interesting when I when I my book first came out a couple of years ago, no one had heard of kefir, and uh, suddenly it's suddenly where I live in in Islington, it's in every shop. You know, you <laughs> you can't move for bloody kefir. It's like, sort of, but basically it's it's sour milk, fermented milk and it has about five times more microbes than the equivalent amount of yogurt. So uh, do get used to it. If you, if, you, if you like yogurt, mix it up, you know, and start having that as a top-up if you want your microbes. How many people here have kombucha? Well, I've got you there. <laughs> okay, kombucha is the next level, you see. Once you've, once you've mastered kefir, you go to kombucha, which is fermented tea. So basically, you get a... a, a it's, and it comes from Russia, and it's very big in California, but it's taken ages to get here. But it's, it's, it's a fantastic drink, uh, and it has uh, about two or three times more microbes even than kefir. And you have fungi in there, but three times of fungi. Basically, you grow this mold thing. It's called a mother. It's a bit like a sourdough mother. And you put it in your tea, and after 10 days, it converts the sugary tea into... Um, a, a, a really refreshing drink that has a slight sour acetic acid taste. It's packed with uh, good stuff. Okay, so we're diverging slightly. I could do the whole kombucha talk, but um, just to show you that these interesting foods all have this common theme. They're all really good for your gut microbes, either as fuel or as providing actual microbes themselves, okay, these probiotics. Um, meat eaters. Um, how many vegetarians in the audience? Not many. Okay. Uh, that's probably generational. Now it's about one in six of the population is uh, vegetarian. Uh, um, less a vegan, but a lot of people have given up meat because they say it's bad for you, it's bad for the planet. Uh, they're partly correct, uh, and most of the studies do show a slight harm of red meat over not eating meat, um, but it's mainly processed meat that's particularly bad. But some people may be able to eat meat fine. It turns out your microbes can determine whether you're someone who processes meat in a healthy way or you produce waste products that give you heart disease. And so there are a number of studies now that show that this just subtle difference in how our microbes 
break down some of the carnitine in meat to other chemicals makes a big difference. And likely many other examples of this, what we call personalized nutrition. Um, this was just to show you, that, did you, there was a headline a few uh, weeks ago that uh, pre, um, probiotics don't work. Remember that? No. Well, it, it, the idea that eating yogurt doesn't work because all the microbes get destroyed. Turns out that's partly true. That most of the microbes get destroyed, but um, if you have a billion of them, there'll always be 100,000 or so that will get through and replicate. But they don't hang around in your gut. Basically, they're there to act as chemical signals for the others. They stimulate all the other microbes, and you get a big metabolic difference. So when we start measuring not the microbes, but the chemicals they produce, we see big differences between yogurt eaters and non-yogurt eaters. And those same micro metabolites they produce, the chemicals we've shown, are actually good at reducing some of the internal fat uh, using our twin study. So it's just a another way of looking at it. Thinking of them as chemical factories makes you understand a bit more why you're going through all this, uh, I and mean, why so many of you are eating your yogurt, because you obviously think it's good, uh, despite the government telling you it's got fat in and you should avoid it. You should always have the full fat one, by the way, not the, um, uh, the low fat one if you want to get most of the benefits. Um, now, uh, just closing up, the, there was a study uh, a couple of years ago. Have you heard of glycemic index of food? So this is on packets where they tell you this is what the carbohydrate content is. Um, and you should, if you want to be on a, you know, uh, avoid sugar spikes and things like this, you should pick low GI foods. Well, it turns out that an Israeli group studied this and found that actually uh, what was more important than your GI index of your food was what your microbes were doing. Okay, so for some people, what's good turns out to be bad. So for me, if I have grapes, my blood sugar goes up into the diabetic range of 9.4. If I have bread, uh, my, I shoot up to about 11 or 12, which is not good. Um, but I can have as much pasta as I like. I can have as much rice as I like. I can drink as much beer or wine as I like. So I'm happy, <laughs> as long as I don't have too much bread. But I wouldn't know that if I hadn't done my own experiments. And uh, what we're hoping is that we can uh, start to measure people's gut microbes in order to predict which foods they should be preferentially having. So everyone should get some personal nutrition. We've started this huge study um, in the UK, in, in our twins, called the PREDICT study. And we've done 300 twins so far doing this kind of two weeks of food, logging all their foods, looking at their, their sugars uh, with these glucose monitors that, you know, I've got one on at the moment. You can now wear them for two weeks. Uh, this shows that one, one twin spiked when they drank Prosecco and the other one didn't, and one spiked with rice and the other one didn't. And these are just small life choices that you can make, that if you thought about this regularly, uh, you would know this could make a big difference over years just by changing what your lunch was or what your favorite drink was. It's not like cutting out huge food groups, it's just making small choices that your microbes prefer. I found out that my average um, lunch at the hospital was tuna sandwiches on bread uh, I think it's from Marks and Spencer's for 10 years because uh, that's what we had in the canteen and I thought that was healthy, it's got a bit of sweet corn in it. Turns out that was every single time it was giving me a, a glucose spike and probably responsible for me gaining 10 kilos over 10 years. If I'd known that now, that I would have been in a much healthier position now. And so just these subtle things of changing what that carbohydrate is can make a huge difference to people's lives. So that's what my particular research is going for in the next, uh, next 10 years. Now, if all this has failed and you can't work out how to improve, these, these uh, tablets might be the thing for you. Uh, they're, they're frozen poo tablets. And you just have to have about 15 of them and you get a, a total makeover. All right? Um, the Americans call them crapsules. They're always very good with the uh, short, snappy phrases. But um, they're no longer a laughing matter because they are the number one treatment for a very severe uh, infection now called recurrent Clostridium difficile infection. People who have too many antibiotics get recurrent infections and they can die, and the people do die, but 
this has a 90% success. If you have a poo transplant from someone who's super healthy and you're, in this, uh, and you're very sick, 90% recovery, which is three times better than the nearest uh, current medical treatment. It also works for ulcerative colitis to the same extent as the uh, latest drugs, and it's being tried in a number of other conditions. And so we know very little about it. It's a very crude tool, as you can imagine, in more ways than one. Um, and everybody's different, so clearly we may have to match donors and recipients in ways we hadn't thought about. But they're using it for all kinds of interesting uh, treatments, including treating diabetes and obesity, etc. So watch this space. Um, finally, um, just to recap, um, I think if you can think of your gut microbes in the, with this gardening analogy, uh, you can't go far wrong. Um, uh, you know, um, it's a key aspect of nutrition. You've got to um, realize that food is, is a series of chemicals. It's not carbohydrates, fat, and protein, and calories. Okay, start thinking of these uh, as, as chemicals that react with other uh, microbes there to produce all this, these chemical reactions which you need. And everyone needs more fiber. There's certain um, more polyphenols, more fermented foods. Um, and we need to explore also the reactions with medicines. Everybody reacts differently as, with medicines as they do with the foods as well. And so none of this is being tested by modern science yet. We haven't caught up. And really, there's huge potential for personalized diets. And the, the one message I want to leave you with is, is diversity, diversity, diversity. The more you can do that, the better. And realize with 100 trillion microbes uh, inside you, you'll never truly dine alone again. Thank you. <laughs>